come to order, we seem a little low in crowd, that's too bad. Um, but, um, that's here. And we have, um, I can't pronounce your full name, Bannock? It's Kristen DeRoja Bannock, yes. I was going to get to the round. <laughs> And do you want to just introduce yourself? Sure. Or, so, yeah. I'm, the, I'm the lead analyst for Connecticut Shellfish Program, so we're for the Department of Agriculture, but we're part of the D Department of Aquaculture. Um, and so we are the lead agency for the regulation of shellfish in Connecticut. And we have a number of roles that we play in that system. So we license all commercial harvesters. Um, we lease shellfish beds in state waters. Um, we, the biggest piece of the program is conducting um, the shellfish growing area um, classification and monitoring. So I'll talk probably more in depth about that than the licensing or anything like that. So we thought we'd give Kristen the, the usual first half hour um, presentation and or discussion and um, then let her get out of here early. Um, and pretty casual, so just please stop and ask me questions if anything comes to mind. Well, if I could just ask for one second. Um, our, uh, our note taker is not here, um, so we just have to go down the line. Also, Rip's not here. This is the favorite part, Kristen. Someone's about to have to <laughs> describe. Um, that's okay. At least you're getting me out early, which I really appreciate because that's not always the case. <laughs> so, so, would it help to have the lights down? For this? A little bit. Do you maybe. not take notes because you're a uh, care on more options? No. <laughs> oh, what do you think of that? I'm capable uh, of taking that. Yeah, that's pretty dark. Too dark. <laughs> the other one is it's not that exciting of a first one. The other one is the front, so it's either all or. Uh, that's, that's, that's okay. Is that okay for you guys? Okay. okay. And David, it was your idea, I think, to have Kristen down, right? You, yeah, so I mean, just, um, I, I've worked quite a bit with Kristen <laughs> and Dave Carey over um, the past few years in, in learning my roles and responsibilities in, in working with um, the commercial people and trying to administer the recreational program in Darien. So they've been a huge help uh, to me. And um, anyway, appreciate your coming down. And, uh, You're very welcome. I'm happy to. <laughs> so did you get the scribe thing as well? Yeah. Good. Okay. okay. So, okay. so, so just to find, yeah. we, you know, so there is a, um, every year in January, we hold a shellfish gathering, which is for recreational shellfish commissions. And uh, David's been attending for yeah. a few years now. Um, but that's where we present updates to the program. We talk about the, um, the water sampling that we do and how we classify growing areas. And every year we give the commissions an update. And because you guys are a coastal advisory committee, um, you know, David's been representing you know, at, the, at the gathering. So I took <coughs> some presentations from that meeting and put them together um, to kind of give you an overview, pretty, you know, high level overview of what we do. Um, we're kind of a very complex program, and so if you're not familiar, um, we're actually overseen by the FDA. So we're a food item, we're a raw food item, so we're considered a high risk program. And so everything is very, it's very conservative and very driven by public health. Um, so the two, our two major shellfish um, species in Connecticut for commercially produced um, shellfish are the hard clam and the eastern oyster, Chrysaster virginica, mercenaria, mercenaria. Shellfish is just a very general term, so that really is a meaningless term because it covers everything, plant, um, crustaceans, mollusks, other um, snails, and all those kinds of things. But the bivalves are, bivalves too, you guys are familiar with this, but this is part of the general program. So um, two hinge shells or valves attached by strong adductor muscles that hold the shells together. We have sedentary burrowing and free swimming species. Um, they are filter feeders, so this is why it ends up being such a conservative program because they eat microscopic plants called phytoplankton, but they can also take in bacteria, viruses, any kind of toxic materials that might be um, in the water. Our four major types are clams, oysters, mussels, and scallops. Recreational programs are harvesting usually a variety of those, depending on what you have in your waters. Um, we do have some bay scallop harvest in the far eastern end of the state, um, but our bay scallops are associated with eelgrass beds, and we don't have a lot of eelgrass in the west here, so we have not um, had scallops here in a while. We do come across them every once in a while, but not really enough to harvest. Um, and these are our most valuable commercial and recreational species in the state at the time. Um, so mercenary mercenaria 
can often be referred to as many different names, quahog, hard clam, round clam, steamer, little neck, cherry stone chowder. Um, all, all, the, all different names for the, same, for the same thing. So northern quahog is the common regional name. Uh, mercenary, mercenary is the scientific name. Hmm. And the quahog, when you hear little necks, top necks, cherry stones, and chowders, this is indicative of the size class that you're um, that you're getting, and so the little necks are the smallest, usually most valuable species. The top necks are a little bit bigger, cherry stones bigger, and then chowders are your biggest uh, biggest clams that you wouldn't want to eat raw in the half shell because it's pretty. And Kristen, big. The, yeah. <laughs> as, as you and I have talked about, and I've expressed to some people here, the clam sets in the sound have been bad. The very, past few years. very bad for a number of years. It's you know it's very alarming. So right now, what used to be considered a little neck. And you can't really find very many of them, so we don't have those recruitment of new classes coming up. Um, what do you mean by bad? So that we haven't had successful uh, clam sets, and so there haven't been good successful then... spawning events that produce baby clams. We haven't had a successful set in a number of years, at least wide scale. So we did some surveying recently in Greenwich, where we did have a few pockets of you know, very small set, but it was very isolated and not very, you know, widespread. And, and mm -hmm. Greenwich has historically been a very big clam producer um, area, and we were doing big grab, grab samples, and we really found very few, um, very few set, except for in a couple of very localized areas. So that's a problem. We don't exactly know why, but it's creating the biggest problem for recreational programs because they can't get clams to seed their recreational beds. Is there a um, running theory at this point, like climate change? Or so you know, we need to have more research done. Nobody's really looking at it right now, um, but it's been raised at, um, there's the Connecticut Shellfish Initiative, which has um, recently uh, been happening, and, and it was recommended by ourselves and by the industry that, it, that some researchers start to look at that. And so we work very closely with the NOAA Marine Fisheries Lab, which we share the property there in Milford. And so we're hoping that some of their scientists will take it up and, and start to investigate. But um, we do have some concerns. I'm going to be at a meeting next week um, about ocean acidification. So we do have some concerns that um, you know, when the pH of the water drops, the, um, when they're in their very juvenile stage, they're floating in the water and they're very small and thin shell that they can't form shells if, if the water's too acidic. And so that could be taking place. We could also have um, acidic conditions in the sh in the sediments themselves that are preventing them, but we don't know. You know, we don't really know what's going on. So it needs some investigation, but it's a problem. Um, shellfish commissions are usually in the position of having to buy either buy clam seed from hatcheries, which is the way we're probably going to have to move into more hatchery production and producing um, producing shellfish seed that way, and then seeding our beds. It could it just um, be a cycle? It could cycle. just be a cycle. And we also have a lot of, we've had some climate issues, uh, water temperature changes, we've had changes in the species composition. Um, so our lobster populations have been on the decline. We have more blue, blue crab populations. And you know some of the harvesters who are out there have, they, their theory is that we just had this you know, this time period that there were not a lot of predators. You know, we had a lobster die off, we had a lot of crabs, you know, we didn't have as many crabs coming into the area yet. And so, you know, there wasn't anything to predate them for, you know, for whatever reason. So that's just, you know, we're not sure, but it's a problem, and um, we're hoping that someone will start investigating it. It's really outside the scope of what we can do um, in our lab. Um, this is a gooey duck clam, and you'd probably be pretty shocked to find one of these here, but they're, they're a West Coast species. They're like a huge steamer, <laughs> and they're actually very thin-shelled, and they have to grow them protected in pipes. They're like very high maintenance, so they grow, um, this, is at, um, this is at a hatchery in Washington State, and they, they produce these in a hatchery, and then they have to plant them in pipes. And so they're protected throughout their whole life cycle. And then to harvest them, they take them out of their pipes and, and then they can sell them. So they're very popular in the Asian market. And they're also very popular in restaurants, in, in, in usually on the West Coast. So I didn't get to eat one, but I held one. And it was huge. It's like the size of a cat. <laughs> it's a big clam. And we have our scallops, which are our um, active swimmers. So unlike the rest of our shellfish, which move pretty slowly, these guys can actually um, 
force water out of their um, shells and, and, and scooch away from predation. And then we have our oysters, our state shellfish here. Um, and growing naturally, we have these forms these clusters or clumps. We don't have oyster reefs like the Chesapeake Bay or some areas down south. Our oysters form more um, flat beds out in our growing areas rather than high reefs. Um, so that's what they look like. Naturally, when they're growing, they'll set just on top of each other. Um, the set are the juvenile oysters, so those are the new oysters that need shell to, um, to attach to. And then we have our mussels, which are pretty commonly recreationally harvested too. Rib mussels, not very edible, but technically not poisonous, but not very good. <laughs> um, and the mussels attach to surfaces using the bissel threads. And they can let go of them. And sometimes they'll jettison themselves, and you'll find beaches um, washed up with lots of, of jet oysters, and it's probably due to um, temperature fluctuations. So if you see that, that could be one of the causes. So you guys have probably spent a lot of time on the shoreline here in Derry and seen some of our, these are our traditional oyster boats. Um, some of these are up to 100 feet in length. And this actually is in Derry, and I think, correct? Does anybody recognize it? It's in Norwalk. Norwalk? Yeah. Okay. No, it's close, right? Coast, <laughs> oh, the yeah, there's Club. the Tokeny Club. Right there we right go. Yeah, that's Derry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So that was kind of a... Little vessel with them. So that's one of our traditional boats. Um, they can harvest huge quantities of shellfish. So we do have, unlike other parts of the country that are struggling with their oyster harvests, we here in Connecticut have very productive natural oyster beds. Um, most of these are natural beds that are held in public trust. Um, we license seed oyster um, harvesters to go into the beds and take seed oysters. Um, and then they're brought out to usually those seed oyster beds are in prohibited areas, so the areas that are not available for shell fishing because of other water quality issues. There's usually sewage treatment plants, there are open rivers that have um, high bacteria levels, but they're safe to be used as a source of seed. So because they're just small oysters when they're coming out of there, they're moved offshore for a period of months to years before they're actually harvested and brought to market. So the oysters are, will be clean by the time they get to market. Um, and we test them. So we're, there's a lot of testing involved in testing the shellfish before they go to market and are sold. And they have and to meet certain criteria. We've been asked to allow people to harvest seed oysters out of the, um, what, is, what is the river that comes down to the boat called? The Good Wives, the Good Wives. River, which yeah. we denied since there's this kind of nice reef structure of oysters that comes up yeah. out, out, out of the muck and it's good for the environment. Sort of and that, that, that might be an area that you could put culch in. So culch is the dried shell material that is put down in these beds. So the beds that are most productive are managed. Mm -hmm. And so the shellfish companies are drying huge piles of shell. They put them down every year on the beds right before spawning and hopefully catch a set. If there is no set, they dredge it all back up and start over. But the shell is constantly being moved back and forth um, to try to capture a set. So if you have an area like that that's got some nice um, you know, areas that are already established by putting shell down further downstream, you might be able to catch some, catch some set. But the timing of it is critical because if, if the shell goes down too early, it gets covered with sediment and then the oysters can't stick. Instead of any layer of, of silt or um, muck on there, they won't be able to set and it will just get washed out. And you won't be able to, uh, they won't be able to grow there. Um, so the shell is a really limited resource and a lot of towns are starting shell recovery efforts and so we I did an event at the for the New Haven Land Trust yesterday and we we save all the shells from that event so we shucked 4100 oysters and we try to get all the shells back so those will go into the shell pile and go back to the river um, the following year to hopefully catch another set but Fairfield's got a shell um, recovery program um, I know Norwalk has a few, Nor Bloom, and it goes around to a few of the restaurants and collects shell. So just something to consider when you're eating shellfish. We've talked about it a little bit as a potential project. It's, uh, it's not hard. There are a lot of restaurants yeah. in Darien. I think that, I mean, there's 10, 20 post. Um, I think listening to the people in Fairfield, they keep some Home Depot buckets maybe out behind a few yeah. restaurants. And it's pretty small. Yeah, but, it's pretty small. And somebody's yeah. got to collect those, and they have to be put in a place and dried in the sun. You can't just it's dump them out. Smell it's it's smelly, so you also yeah. have to be aware of, like, you have to have an area to put them. So if you, I think Fairfield's lucky because they have their kind of public works area where the sewage treatment plant is. And so there's other 
other odors there, so um, they can get away with it. But um, the biggest shell pile we have is in New Haven on the Quinnipiac River, and it's it's monstrous. It's building sized, um, pretty impressive, huge pile, and they've had to go to very extreme lengths to get the odor under control there. They're spraying things all year round, and um, the neighbors call me to complain that it smells. <laughs> so that's my job. <laughs> Um, so in Connecticut, we have this, uh, while many of our fishery species in Connecticut are, so we've lost a lot of our lobster harvest, we still have a few kind of grandfathered in, you know, permits that are, you know, they're harvesting a small number of lobsters. Uh, mostly that is, is gone. Um, fin fish, another area that's really been on the decline for commercial fishing out of Connecticut. So oysters and clams are really, this, they're making up the bulk of our fishing um, industry at this time. And so oysters and clams together, about a $30 million industry in Connecticut based on our most recent landing number. Um, so this has been on the increase. So you can see we in the um, on the oyster side, we had this drop down in 2004. So at the end of the 90s, we had an oyster mortality event. So we had a couple of oyster specific diseases that wiped out nine, probably 95% of our oyster populations. And so you'll see the harvest numbers went down very far. Um, but since then, we've been rebuilding. And we do have a few companies that are truly farming and cultivating oysters, um, which this you know, whole movement of shell is a huge time commitment. It's very resource intensive and labor intensive. You have to have big boats to do that. So we do have um, one primary company that's keeping you know, that part of it active. Um, and some of the natural beds have been very productive and in, in, in having successful sets of new oysters every couple of years. So it's kept the industry going. Um, hard clams, on the other hand, there's our dip that we were talking about. We've had, you know, this lack of recruitment. So everything that's out there is being harvested and there's no young ones coming up to replace them. So everything's getting bigger and bigger, which the value, the larger they get, the, the less they're worth. And so that those values are, are steadily dropping. But oysters, on the other hand, are becoming more and more valuable. Um, you know, there's been a huge explosion in oyster raw bars in this area, in this region especially. And so um, they're they're getting a lot more money for the oysters now than they were say five years ago. So it's 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 a success story for Connecticut. What's the gap in the in the in the chart between So we didn't have landing data during those years. Okay. Um, it wasn't a shutdown. No, no, we had there was harvest throughout that period, but there was um, there were some industry members who did not choose to provide their landings data to us, so we didn't have complete numbers, and so we've left those out. So 2016 was the first year um, our national program that they operate under has a mandatory reporting requirement, and so therefore we had to require them by. You know, you if you if you want your license, you have to report your landings mm -hmm. to us. So that's that's the way it is. We have to, we have to threaten. You know, right. <laughs> it's the uh, stick instead of the carrot. So is, is the industry sort of scrappy that way? They no. are. No. They're very you know independent. They're out there on the water all the time. You know, and the the regulation of the shellfish industry is intense. And so I totally get it. Uh, but we just need to you know we have to do what we have to do. But this is so I'd like to encourage you all to eat Connecticut shellfish if you can. Uh, we do have some of the safest oysters. Um, I'm gonna show you a little video. We have very stringent temperature controls in Connecticut, so we have very few illnesses associated with our raw shellfish. And this is one of the operations. Um, you can see this is this is one of Norm Bloom's boats and they have this uh, rapid cooling set up on their boat. So those vats are filled with an ice slurry. Um, and so, these oysters, what they're doing is, is moving lots of oysters to these beds um, throughout the year. And then during the summer, they have this one boat that has the ice slurries on it. And they're, these oysters are never exposed. They are scooped up and put into the slurry. Um, and they can fill this boat in half an hour and then steam back. And everything is down below 50 degrees in less than an hour. And so that keeps bacteria from growing. And we've had a lot of success with that. Yeah, the oysters that they're harvesting are, are they a mix between naturally spawned and grown and, and cultivated so or, or farm? Norms is primarily um, wild spawn cultivated product. So they're moving oysters, they're prep, uh, they're putting shell down in the natural beds, they're catching a natural set, 
and then they're putting them down in the oysters. However, they do have, um, there's, they have an oyster hatchery right now in New Haven, and they're doing what's called remote setting or spat on shell, where they're putting larvae into big tanks that have shell in them, and then the oysters set on the shell, and then they'll move the shell out. So they have a combination, and that's gonna be important. That's probably what we're gonna see more of. That's where the industry is going to transition to is having, you know, because it's not necessarily reliable to have. You're you know, ensuring the set, if you will, correct. and then let them cultivate on their own. Yep. Yep. So this is that's how that goes, and so that's that's been very effective for us here in Connecticut. Um, and our hard clam harvest, so they're using hydraulic dredges. So these, you see the yellow um, hoses there. Those are forcing water into the sediments. So people hear the word dredge and they think about like a navigational channel dredging where they're taking you know huge amounts of sediment out and that's not what we have here in Connecticut. Um, the hard clams live very close to the surface so these dredges are not digging down. The, the water comes in and loosens up the clams and then the dredges come along behind and scoop up the loosened clams and so these dredges are really only going into the very surface and the areas recover very quickly after Noah's done a lot of studies of um, the effects of, of hydraulic dredging on the other organisms that live there and there's really been very short-lived effects and some positive effects from from dredging. So when this goes on in Scott Cove for example I think the general view the Department of Agriculture. This is good for the marine environment to get some of that muck. It does, it, yes, up. because uh, the mud, the muck is anoxic. Nothing wants to live there, and so some, of, especially with the oyster beds in particular, um, that shell needs to be worked in order to expose it because of the siltation. We do have a lot of heavy siltation in most of our our near shore areas in Connecticut, and so it lasts their work. They become um, unproductive if beds are left to sit and aren't aren't touched for any length of time. Um, so it's good for the oyster beds especially. Hard clams, um, that, that movement and aeration of the bottom is, is good to a certain extent, but now we don't have any, you know, <laughs> we're, we're kind of worried about what's happening with the production there. But is, there is there an environmental argument to be made for, uh, if you're dredging, that you're killing everything else? So, so yeah, so that's not the case. Um, so that's what the NOAA studies have looked at. They, they look at the abundance of all the other animals that are there. And because these near shore areas are normally subject to a lot of turnover and um, you know current related events, and they're called, um, I don't forget the name for it, but they, they recover quickly. They're used to being disturbed and then there's a transition of organisms that come back. And so they followed that whole transition. So the disturbance is short-lived. And in terms of the big picture, it's not a lot of acreage that you're talking about. And they do recover quickly. And there's also some benefits of, of aerating Aerate. and oxygenating the sediments um, with the hydraulic dredging that helps to improve the chemistry in the sediments. So it's not just making it good for other shellfish or future shellfish, it's making it good for a lot of things. Yeah, it can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and of course that's with uh, responsible and sustainable right. you know, practices, which not all of our companies you know, do. The vast majority of our companies are in it for the long haul, and they've been doing this for years, and multi-generational, and there's more of a cultivation rather than a wild fishery, kind of get, get in there and take everything and get out, um, because they need to sustain, you know, the business is going forward. And most of these, this is the last, this is our last fishery in the state, really. And so, you know, if you want to work on the water, um, this is one of the last ways you're going to be able, you know, to do that. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, some other parts of the program. So that's our kind of industry overview. I'm going to get into more now what we do on the water quality and growing area classification side of things. And I, I threw the dye study stuff in there first. Um, this is kind of one of the more exciting, <laughs> if you will, parts of the job. Um, in order to assess sewage treatment plants, now you guys don't have a plant, but you have, um, your sewage goes to Stanford, so it's far away from you, and you don't need to worry about it unless a pipe breaks. Um, but we but do we, have residential uh, septic tank. Yes, you guys most have a lot of septic down on the shoreline. Um, and so a lot, most of our big cities have large sewage treatment plants, and so they're our biggest pollution source that we need to assess. And so we conduct these hydrographic dye dilution studies where we're putting a fluorescent dye in at the plant, and then we are able to track 
where the um, sewage goes and at what concentration. And these are big studies that um, we have partners from FDA engineering teams that come in and EPA comes in and sometimes we'll have our partners from other states coming in. It takes a lot of people. It's a multi multi-day process where usually study, you know, these studies could last up to two weeks. Um, they're pretty in-depth. But the study was conducted in May of that was Yeah, that's, this is an old one. <laughs> no, but it, it, but it says... It, okay. That's not true. That's just an old slide, sorry. Okay, no, we have a final sure report. Still not report <laughs> no, it, does, it does take a long time. It is the federal government, but we do have a final report on this one. Um, so this is from, this is the Stratford Sewage Treatment Plant, and so this is where the outfall actually just, you know, it just discharges into a river, really, that runs into the Housatonic River. Um, and this is, you know, these are really intense studies. You know, we're at the plant 24 hours and taking shifts, but it's pretty, it's, it's a pretty cool process um, to go through. And when we're done, we end up with something like this, where we have um, the colors indicate the concentration of sewage, and the darker pink and red areas are higher concentration, so more sewage and the blue areas are less impacted by sewage. So we get these very detailed um, understanding of where the sewage is going and how it impacts the shellfish growing areas. Um, part of the other part of the study, so we've done one of these um, studies in the Mystic River, um, and this is me, you know, grabbing oysters out of a cage, but we're able to test now for viruses um, it's a viral indicator, it's not a virus per se, um, but viruses have been traditionally hard to test for. We can easily test for bacteria, fecal coliform, or enterococcus, but the viruses are harder, um, harder to work with. And so this is a test that we can now do to test sewage treatment plants, and we can test the oysters and identify the impacts to the shellfish there. Um, and the bacteria levels, it's usually kind of opposite from the viruses. So viruses are usually circulating in the environment in the winter months when it's colder. They like it cold and dark. Um, and that's when most people are sick with noroviruses. Those stomach bugs are circulating in the population during the winter. Summer is the opposite. So we have lots of, lots of animals, lots of birds, and bacteria grows happily in warm conditions. So we have you know, these two aspects that impact us at different times of the year. So ungulate has got norovirus from some local clams <clears throat> or oysters. That, that was awful. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, but I and, and I understood at the time that there was an outbreak of it. Um, so, but it's sort of spotty and it's quick. Yes. Um, not, not the effects, but the but this, the impact. So if it's because if it's because of a sewage event, you know that could be. It's just the timing <clears throat> of that. So how do you? Garden for that. So, I'll, for that. yep, I'll, we'll get to the Sorry. show with the growing area classification part. So, we do, I mentioned how conservative we are, and this is why these are the extents that we need to go to to test, you know, the sewage treatment plants to make sure that um, we have an adequate distance from the plant to ensure that the shellfish are not impacted. Um, obviously, there could be a spill at any time. You know, if you have a sewer system, you have a break, you could have a raw sewage discharge, but generally, um, generally, Things, up, things work very well <laughs> in Connecticut most of the time. Um, so I threw a few slides about shellfish handling. So um, shellfish should always be kept at less than 45 degrees. If you're buying shellfish at the store or harvesting shellfish yourself, bring a cooler and ice and get them on ice as soon as you can. Um, storing shellfish in water is an old wives' tale, and you don't want to store them in fresh water because they, you, can't, they, you can kill them and then you don't want to eat dead shellfish. Um, you can um, if you can tap a shellfish if it's gaping when you pick it up. If you tap it and it doesn't close, throw it away. Um, if you cook it and it doesn't open, throw it away. It's not worth to uh, risk it. Um, this is for storing the shellfish that's closed tightly, like oysters and clams. You can keep up to seven days. Uh, mussels are a little bit shorter time frame, but soft shell clams or razor clams that don't close all the way, you want to use those you know very quickly after you after you purchase them. It's good to keep a damp towel on top of them to maintain a higher humidity level, but just keep them open to the air because you don't want to keep them in a plastic bag that can smother them. They still need to respirate, open and close. Um, so that, those are the rules for that. Um, in terms of eating raw shellfish, uh, some populations are at greater risk for foodborne illness and should not eat raw fish or shellfish or anything really. Um, including pregnant women, young children, older adults. So anyone who has immune system issues, um, if you're undergoing treatment for cancer, 
if you have liver disease, hepatitis. Um, also, what's an, a, an unusual finding that we're seeing lately is people that take acid reducers, um, which reduce the stomach acid. Also, the stomach acid is what fights off bacteria in your gut, and so we're seeing a lot more of foodborne illness and people that take acid reducers, and mostly everyone is on something. I mean, it seems like a lot of people <laughs> are taking something. Um, but you should always check with your doctor if you're unsure if your condition um, allows you to eat shellfish or not. Um, this is the Sea Grant Guide to Shellfishing. So there's a lot of towns along the shoreline that do have recreational programs, and this tells you where to find um, permits and how much they cost and what your, all your rules are. And we update this frequently. Um, this is something for my boating population here, we always like to point out. Um, norovirus is our biggest concern with boats and sewage dumping, and although New, New um, Long Island Sound is a no-discharge zone, um, we do have dumping that goes on, and so we always like when I have this kind of group, it's good to spread the word. <laughs> that make sure we keep our sewage, keep an eye out, look for, you know, look for people doing things that they shouldn't do. We have much more popularity of people go, going out boating and rafting up together for the weekend. You know, there's no restrooms available. Hopefully there's, um, they have heads that are functional on their boats. And, so this is the problem. <laughs> that, that third bullet is intimidating. Exactly. One so this person. is the problem. It takes a very, very small amount of, of sewage or fecal material to contaminate vast areas of water. Um, well, this is why Ziegler's is closed seasonally to, yes. to shell fishing. Yeah. Um, since there's so many. That's been a very popular, there. that's been mentioned in boating magazines and yachting magazines as a great place to raft up for the weekend. So, um, and we have had norovirus outbreaks associated with boats. And especially what we, you know, what people don't really think of if you're sick, if you have to vomit and you everyone goes over the edge, and that also can contaminate. There's actually more viruses in human vomit. Excuse me, that's, this is my job. <laughs> um, but norovirus shut down one of our largest um, oyster festivals in the country um, this year in Cape Cod, a couple of years ago actually, and they could not serve raw oysters at their oyster festival because of a norovirus outbreak. That was probably caused by their own harvesters contaminating their beds being sick and working out in their growing area. So it's a big deal. <laughs> um, how, how am I doing on time? You're fine. All right. So we operate under a national program. So Shellfish is its own really special program. It's called the National Shellfish Sanitation Program. We're overseen by FDA. So we just got over our last FDA evaluation last week. Um, there's state control, so we have state shellfish control authorities, and then industry. And every two years, all of these groups come together, and we actually write the regulations that we all agree to abide by. Um, and that's at this Interstate Shellfish Sanitation Con Conference. And so that's coming up in a couple of months, and it's a nightmare. It's like 14 hour days, and everyone's just arguing and debating. It's parliamentary procedure, it's a nightmare. Um, so I'm out of it this year, so I'm not going. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a very interactive program that can change rapidly depending on what's emerging um, as issues. So our, our task is to implement the, these regulations. Um, we have a growing area program, shellfish sanitation, which is our plant inspection process. We go to harvesters and facilities that handle shellfish and we license them and we inspect them as you would uh, as a health inspector inspects restaurants. Uh, we have a Vibrio program, which is separate, and then enforcement, which is our shared by our um, DEP and con officers. Our staff is small, so we manage the shellfish program for the entire state, and there's 12 of us. We are fully staffed for the first time, um, almost fully staffed. We're still vacant of shellfish pathologists, but almost fully staffed for the first time, but a tiny, you know, tiny group of people that are doing too much. <laughs> um, so we have all of these different responsibilities, and we have other things like aquaculture permitting, which includes fish farming and fish aquaculture, and now seaweed cultivation is a big deal, kelp production. Um, I conduct all the illness investigations for the state, so if there is an illness, I'm the one that goes out and investigates that. Um, we also have a laboratory in Milford, so we do all of the, all the testing that's associated with the shellfish program. So we test water, we test shellfish, 
but our laboratory director is also the dairy guy. So he's doing laboratory evaluations for the Connecticut dairy industry. So um, we do a lot there. When you say we test shellfish if there's an illness or, or a contamination of some mm -hmm. sort, is are they that trackable? Like, are the harvest tracked that well? So, like, if you get a bad shellfish in New Haven, you know it comes from the grounds off of X. Or it depends. Is so, it like, most let's people, start here. yeah, most people are eating shellfish in mixed plates. They want to try an oyster from the West Coast. They want to try one from yeah. Canada, and so usually you can't track it down. But in some cases, restaurants that only buy from you know one one guy <laughs> so you know it's his stuff um, so there's you know it's probably you know maybe 10 percent that you can actually trace back um, the interesting thing that's happening now is there's a lot of more um, all illnesses in Connecticut are going through whole genome sequencing and so we're able to get very specific information about the strains of bacteria and those we're finding can be sometimes tracked back to specific growing areas. So that's that's really changing the game. Um, so we'll see where that goes, but we're getting a lot better at seeing, you know, patterns of, of specific bacteria strains in different parts of the country. And then do you find that when you have, say, an illness that you can track back to one place, is it the majority of that harvest from that location is affected by it, or is it just kind of... So these are usually the, the what we see the most um, illnesses from in Connecticut, because we don't have a big norovirus issue, because we're very conservative, um, is, is Vibrio bacteria, Vibrio parahemolyticus. It's a naturally occurring bacteria. It's in all estuarine waters. Um, and that is usually just, it's usually isolated cases, but there's some areas that are really hot spots for it. And so Duxbury, um, Massachusetts has had closures, you know, multiple years. Uh, Martha's Vineyard, Katama Bay um, has been a hot spot, and they're trying to find ways to manage around it. But they have more illnesses, but they also have a captive population. Martha's Vineyard, you know, you're eating usually eating oysters from Martha's Vineyard, and the doctors and the hospitals on Martha's Vineyard know that people are eating oysters, and so they're testing for the bacteria. Um, so they're kind of have a closed loop there that it makes it much more easy to know. Um, our oysters, on the other hand, are going all over the country. They go to the Midwest, they go to California, they go down south, they go everywhere, and so it takes a lot longer for that trait, that chain of events to come back to us. Um, but if you get enough illnesses in one place, we have to make closures, and if there's enough people involved, then we recall shellfish, and then it becomes you know millions of dollars of, of lost income and multiple illnesses, so nobody wants that. <laughs> it's a biology question. In Catalma, which is on the island of um, Martha's Vineyard, and I, I think it, the beach is cut through, so it's sort of a flow through area. Yeah, it's closed back off. And, oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. Doesn't there have to be enough rainfall to make it an estuarine environment? And is there enough just from that little land on the island sitting nearby? Yeah, so that's a I guess it's a, I guess it's historically an oyster producing area. They do have hatcheries also, though, so they may have they probably have more hatchery seed and cage culture there. Um, than natural production like we do here in Connecticut. So every state's different, and I don't know that much about you know their their you know their issues, but they grow them very nicely. They have they grow a lot of oysters, <laughs> enough to um, to have closures and recall. So uh, so this is this is our growing area classification. Um, so like surface waters are classified for different uses. Um, the shellfish shellfish waters are classified for specific um, uses. And so any blue area is an approved area that's suitable for um, for direct consumption. We have other areas that are these yellow areas that are conditionally approved. So they close after certain events. So you guys are used to we have closures after rainfall events. Um, these all have different rainfall triggers. Um, some of these areas have sewage treatment plants, that are, you know, some distance from them that may have an issue that causes the area to close. Um, we do have a lot of these red areas that are these prohibited areas, and this is where most of our sewage treatment plants, most of our natural oyster beds are. Um, all of these green areas are called restricted areas, and they have high bacteria levels, but are still suitable for relay. And so companies will come to those areas and move shellfish into approved or conditionally approved areas. They're there for a period of time, usually several weeks to a month, and then we test them. As long as the bacteria levels are low, then they can go ahead and harvest um, for market. Could you talk to us about our recent regulations? So off of Norwalk, I believe in Darien, there's a new rain trigger. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I will talk about that. I have another, a few other slides after that. Um, 
So I talked about this, you guys get this. They're filter feeders, they're concentrating anything that might be in the water, um, along with bacteria and viruses, and also toxic plankton. So we've had more harmful algal blooms in recent years in the region and different species of algae that are producing different toxins. And so this is an area of the program that we've had to really amp up in recent years. Um, we've had some closures in Rhode Island, and we have closures across, across the Sound in New York. So we've not had extensive um, blooms that have affected our shellfish beds in recent years, but it's always, it's always a possibility. So we do a lot of plankton screening and we test the tissues for toxin. Uh, we do all this work to classify the growing areas. So we actually walk the shoreline physically. We map and identify all pollution sources that are impacting the water. Uh, we test stormwater outfalls. We test any, we look for failing septic systems. Um, we do, we have 500 water quality monitoring stations throughout the sound. We're testing those, you know, on a once a month basis primarily. Um, we're testing shellfish meats after rainfall events to make sure everything is clean. Um, we do surveys of marinas, count boats. Marinas are a big potential pollution source if people dump their sewage possibly. So all of these pieces come together. We come up with these maps. Um, we have to identify every sewage treatment plant, every marina. Um, <coughs> any stormwater outfall needs to be identified. Any sources of pollution like animal populations all have to be identified. So it's a pretty extensive report that comes out after a sanitary survey. Um, and we establish all the correct classifications for that for that area. Sampling, um, we do collect our water quality samples. We test for fecal coliform bacteria as an indicator of, of sewage. Um, we collect those samples uh, under, it's called adverse pollution conditions, so we collect after rainfall events when the areas are most likely to be impacted. Uh, we test our conditional areas are sampled once a month when it's open. If we get a rainfall event that closes the area, we have to sample before we can reopen, and we sample waters and shellfish to reopen. Um, so there's a lot of testing that can go on. In one growing area, we might be in an area two or three, four times, depending on how many rain events um, we get. You know, are you, sorry, are you one of the 12 in your office doing all these samplings, or are there Yes, we, it's usually, I've, I'm like the senior staff right now. Um, I've been there for 15 years, so I am more involved in the administration and bureaucracy of it. So I spend all day answering emails. David can attest to this. Um, but so the younger people are usually the ones that are out in the boat all day. <laughs> it, it's a, it's a so, boat it's a trailer yeah, to a local shore. So we have, and, yeah. um, we have a boat that we keep in Westport for most of the year to get the western end of the sound. And individual recreational programs do sample the beds in, under their jurisdiction. So Greenwich, for example, samples all of their recreational beds. Um, we don't get down there usually because they have that they have that cover. Same with the far eastern end of the state, Stonington, Rotten, those shellfish commissions do all of their own water sampling. We tell them when they need to sample based on the rain events and things, but how do we sample their dairy? What's that? How do we sample dairy? We sample for you. So we sample Darien, um, we sample Stamford, <coughs> Darien, Norwalk, Westport, Fairfield, Stratford, Milford. West Haven, New Haven, East Haven, Brantford. And we go to Brantford, so, so we go basically for dairy and to Brantford. Yeah, so a quick one. Um, yeah. I know uh, it became more restricted this summer, like one and a half inches yes. or something like that. That's one and a half inches in a week? Or That's a 24 week? hour period. The 24 hour Or one period. event. Okay. If it goes longer than 24 hours, um, that's so a So if you get like event. a quarter of an inch of rain for six days in a row, is that. Mm -hmm. that so it, won't, it, won't, it won't hit the trigger. Okay. And that's actually... It just seemed like the beds were close to They were. We had incredible... Yeah. Well, I don't know if you it watched the radar. Right. So there were these systems that there would be nothing, basically nothing, and right. then everything would just kind of Dump. coalesce, like right, right at the like western end, end of the sand. at all this year. Like, it's either the tide's wrong or it's closed. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, so the inch and a half mm -hmm. thing is lifted. I'll get... I'll throw a couple of... Let me just going to zoom through these. Um, so there's our dairy and shellfish classifications in our stations. So these stations are the ones that we're having issues with. So these are approved. You guys have a lot of approved water in dairy and so that should be what that means in Connecticut at least is water quality should be good even up to three inches of rain. So after, you know, we expect to see negative impacts at greater than three inches of rain. And what has happened, we had 2018 
was a really bad year for water quality, and especially in the western end of the sound. And a lot of these stations started failing at less than an inch of rain. And normally what that would trigger would be the downgrade of all these areas. So that would be, <coughs> that would be worse um, than what we did. We kind of talked our FDA specialists into letting us manage it as if it were conditionally approved just for the months that we had the high bacteria levels. And they went along with that um, because the alternative is downgrading everything to a conditionally approved area. And then that would mean we have to up our sampling frequency. We'd have to sample after every rainfall event. We have to sample to reopen areas. So we're trying to avoid that because it's a lot more work for us and it results in more closures for you. Um, so we're hoping we can get enough data. We collected more wet weather data this year to see if we can if things will start passing again. If, if we had very different rain events in recent years, we had a long period of drought, and then we had in 2018 more rain, we had 50% like more rain than we've had normally. So this is the Shellfish um, Aquaculture Mapping Atlas, and you can go here. This is, um, our, most of it is our data. Um, it's managed by UConn's CLEAR program and in conjunction with um, Connecticut Sea Grant. You can go here, turn on, turn on and off layers, see where all your shellfish beds are. You can see where any aquaculture operations are. You can see where our water quality monitoring stations are. So that's a great source of information. I am gonna send that, I'll send the presentation out to you guys after, so you guys will have the links and everything um, if you wanna look that up. I'm gonna talk now about the closure stuff because that's what you guys really care about. Let's see. That's a lot of files. It is. I'm sorry, I have a messy desktop. <laughs> oh. So this is, we just presented this to the, um, our commercial guys in the spring. Um, so we've had extreme precipitation events. So rather than having, you know, an inch and a half or two inches that, you know, is happening over a 24, 48 hour period, we've had these really intense events where three inches of rain falls in a short amount of time. So what happens is the ground can't absorb it. It ends up running off along with everything else that's accumulated. And so we've had these really extreme precipitation events and we're seeing more and more of those. And I think everybody sees that happening. It's pretty clear. Um, 2017 versus 18. Um, in 17 we saw 45 inches of rain in Norwalk versus 68 inches, 50% increase. Um, 77% increase in Greenwich, so this is pretty dramatic. Um, so we had a lot more closures in 2018 and 19. Um, we've had impacts to our water quality. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing impacts at, at lower volume of rain because of the intensity of these events. And a lot more of these really intense events, so more closures. Probably more impervious surfaces. A lot more impervious. That's always happening. Uh, we're rarely going the other direction, um, so that has a big impact. Um, so this is what we do. We have to run these statistics. The national program tells us how we need to analyze the data. Um, in approved areas, which is all of your, most of your growing areas are approved, so we, we're required to sample them five times a year under adverse conditions, so after a rain event. and. Sample results need to be less than 14 colony forming units per 100 mLs. Um, and if they're greater than that, or greater than 31, 31 is the limit. So if we get more than 10% of samples greater than 31, that makes the area fail. And so we've got these, in an area like Darien, a three year period would be 15 samples. We were one short because we were understaffed for a long time. Um, but we had two elevated counts. So anything greater than 31 is highlighted here. And that means that we have 14% greater than 31, which results in a failing um, grade for that station. And the majority of the stations in Darien failed. And some of these were extremely high for shellfish program numbers, so 170. Um, greater than 80, 80, 80, 81 is the highest that 80 is the highest that our test at the low level can sample for. So if it's greater than 80, it just we call it 81. Um, and some of these samples were really high. Um, and so that's after a lot of rain. That's 1.98 inches. However, these data should be good up until three inches of rain because it's a, an approved area. So we're going to have to monitor this. But some of these high counts were at less than an inch and a half. So that's why we had to go with the inch and a half trigger this year. 
um, which is now over. So now if we get an inch and a half of rain, you guys will be okay. Um, we're back to a three inch status in Darien. Um, so get out there during the fall and hope for dry weather. Because um, I don't know, you know, this these kind of water quality impacts have been extending. Like the, you know, some unusual ones are in February. An inch and a half of rain in February usually does not trigger elevated counts like this. So that's a pretty extreme finding. Um, but all it would take is maybe one failed septic system that's getting washed out. Yeah, it doesn't take a lot. <laughs> Um, and we do have some issues, so, you know, some areas around Scotts Cove especially, you know, are inundated at low water or they also have septics on very rocky soils which aren't good for sewage treatment. And so that's why we have the, the prohibited classification in the near shore in Scotts Cove is just because of the uncertainty associated with, with um, septic systems. Did these fails indicate any particular area? This is more, it? no, this is across the board. Across this the is board, all, yeah. and this was not just Darien, it was Norwalk and Westport too. Um, Norwalk less so because most of their approved areas are offshore outside of the islands, and so there's less of an impact there. Um, the one that failed was the one closest to Darien. Um, so Good Wives, you know, Good Wives River is a source for sure, Five Mile River is a source for sure. Any of those, you know, any of those streams that you know, are draining a larger watershed are more of a likely to, to impact the and roaming areas. And is what you saw off there in Norwalk with these samples, is that replicated up and down the state? So this isn't abnormal this, for Connecticut? This is this what season? we saw in 2018, and it's probably just due to the intensity of the events that we've, you know, that we've had, rather than, a, a, it's probably not a large scale decline in water quality, that was my question. But, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, because you know, our sewage treatment plants are very good. Our sewage treatment is getting better and better. Um, but it's just these intense rain events are the grounds cannot absorb the water, and it's all coming off as stormwater runoff, and it's going further, and it's impacting our beds further out, and that's what this is indicating. The maps that you saw before, we have the conditional areas that we expect to be impacted after rain events, and that's why we have triggers of an inch or two inches that close them you know, more frequently. Approved areas should be less impacted after those rain events. Um, and the fact that, that we're seeing these impacts at lower lower amounts of rain is concerning. Um, so we do a lot of extra testing to see, you know, to see what's going on. And while that may put us off of our recreational beds for some period of time, it's putting commercial people. Oh yeah, they're they're flipping out. This off year. of their, <laughs> it, it, it's putting them out of work essentially yeah. for some period of time, which is awfully concerning. And so I think all of this work that people have been doing here on water quality is vitally important. It really to, is. to people who work for a living. Yeah. Um, and we have some companies that you know if they only have one shellfish bed and they're shut down, then they're shut down, period. There's no, they're not making any money and they're not working for that period of time. Um, and so these closures, more frequent closures, really impact you know, their, their business. And some of them, you know, I don't know if they're gonna last another year like this if we still have these kind of issues happening. So, I mean, Durian's got its share of, hey, let's um, change those houses near the shore away from the septic systems to connecting to their sewers. Got, we have our share of that up and down mm -hmm. the coast. But none of these events are screaming, do that now. This is such a big macro thing happening yeah. that it's really, we're, we're affected and there's big, nothing we can, yeah. it's this out of our control. This is meteorological yeah. and it's not surprising, but what we're trying to do, what I'm working on now with, I have partners in, at NOAA who do a lot of predictive modeling and forecasting. And so we're working on a pilot program for this area for Norwalk Westport. Um, primarily because we have a lot more understanding of the hydrographics of the area there, is to try to forecast because there's a lot more predictive models for stream flow and intensity of rain and impervious surfaces and we can do a better job of predicting you know, when areas are going to be closed. We can be a little bit more prescriptive about closures maybe, we're hoping, mm -hmm. um, if the data turns out, but it just takes a lot of, um, a lot of more engineering type modeling people to to do that, that I don't have that expertise, but I know people that do. So um, I'll be working with them to try to get something, hopefully for next year, and we can at least have you know a better understanding and refine the triggers. So um, maybe cause less, you know, maybe these 24-hour rain events are not the problem. It's just these really intense, high-level rains. So we might have to you know play around with the triggers, hopefully, and get you know get better at it. The science is there, so we just need to, to work with the right people. But 
that is, that's the Norwalk one. So this has happened in, this is Norwalk, so you can just see this is just, you know, close to the Five Mile River there. That's the area that's closing now. The rest of their areas are further offshore outside the islands, and those are not as impacted. But you have a lot more water out there and a lot more dilution. Um, Westport, this is a big commercial impact here. Um, so this is now all closing after an inch and a half of rain. And this is making people nuts. But this has been a really, really rainy summer. And so we still, we still saw the same trends that we saw in 2018, just these really intense events that impacted water quality. Um, so I'm not sure what the answer is, but we're going to try to figure it out. Um, so you guys, you guys are basically being treated like a conditionally approved area in the summer months, but hopefully it will be short-lived and we can get back to normal. But now you're free inches again, so yay. <laughs> does water temperature help stuff? Water temperature does, you know, play a large role in any of the bacterial issues. So that could for sure. That's the playing field's changing there also, yeah. or has been for some Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are a lot more surface, like impervious surfaces are huge, development, you know, ex you know, expanding development, all that's just creating more and more impervious surface. So, um, you know, any local efforts at um, identifying water quality issues are really beneficial, you know, from the shellfish program perspective, because we, you know, we're concentrating on the big picture at the shoreline, and we can't really do much work up in the watersheds, we just don't have the staff or the resources to do that, but at the local level, this is where it becomes, you know, really critical because you actually have the, um, you know, the ability to make changes. You know, if there's water quality things that you can find going on incorrect, um, you have jurisdiction to do that at the town level versus at the state level. We we can't tell anyone to go fix a failing septic system, but your health department can. So, but it's sort of amazing that. Uh, um the big macro events, in some sense, seem to be resetting the playing field so much that it sounds like people don't really know what the solutions on shore are right. at this point. I mean, they may just need to be a lot more drastic than anyone's envisioned. We need to do a better job with stormwater. Stormwater is everything. Stormwater is so much more impactful than mm -hmm. than anything else in the sound right now. Um, it's not coming from our sewage treatment plants. We have water quality issues. Everybody wants to point the finger at the sewage treatment plants, but that's not that's not the big problem. It's stormwater getting a handle on that and trying to keep it from getting, you know, keeping from as much of it getting out into the water as possible. So finding waves to get retention. Um, there's some treatment going on in ponds, you know, where things can settle out before, you know, release the water slowly rather than one big flush. Um, there was some drain filtration things that they were trying a few years ago. That wasn't that wasn't very successful. Um, but you know, holding as much water back as possible, allowing more areas for you know rain to to soak in rather than run off because that's the biggest. You know, that's it's not easy. There's a lot of it. Um, and I live in New Haven, and people are building, you know, building rain gardens and all of that. Is it's that's great for getting, um, for raising awareness, you know, about stormwater and thinking about people putting in new driveways and considering maybe making impervious. <coughs> you know, but they're all pretty small, small scale, scale stuff compared yeah. to what we're being hit with when we talk about the sudden rainfalls. Yeah, and so big municipal projects are very expensive, and it's probably. They're less likely to happen, but they they have been happening in isolated areas. So if there's enough public awareness of them, um, if you know it takes the you know the local constituency to want to, <coughs> want to change it and want to invest in it, which is a, it's a hard sell. Mm. People don't know <laughs> or don't care. So Can we want to grab Kristen for any last questions. And so um, I was just going to see if we can move. Uh, oh, you want my to talk my about agenda <laughs> I sure. up while she is still here, um, in case there are any good. questions. So I'm going to pass these two items around. I just wanted to quickly ask you if there's any um, any tests that it sounds like you know there's sort of a lack of resources um, on your end. Are there any tests that that you you would like to see done that are just not within your 
capabilities so right now? So it's more what we're what we don't have right now is good near shore. If you look at the um, water quality sensors that are available, like temperature and salinity and pH and all of those things, most of our work is being done out, out in the middle of the sound. Most of our shellfish beds are buried near shore, so there's a big gap there in you know in data that's available. So it's hard to you know make these predictions and correlations. We don't have data in the areas that we're trying to look at. So, but the technology has come so far that the modeling is you know the modeling is actually probably better than real time data at this point. It's gotten so advanced. So. Um on the shellfish report, quick refresher, in 2018, we allowed um, the freights to harvest shellfish from the uh, restricted relay area of Scott Cove. If you look at the little map on one of the pages that I distributed, that's the green area. Uh, the freights came back and asked to harvest uh, in Scott Cove again in 2019. And after a meeting in February in Milford with Dave Carey, who's the head of the Department of Aquaculture, we agreed to allow them to go into Scott Cove for up to 25 days before the end of April. Um, the Department of Aquaculture provided me with this. Uh, all, all commercial harvesters have GPS tracking on their vessels now. Um, and so they provided me with a listing of the dates um, when they were active in that area, as well as you can see the, the kind of blue to purplish dots of where, where they were operating. So while uh, they operated within uh, the bounds of the total number of days, we were well outside of the period of time uh, when they were supposed to be uh, operating. They went uh, a number of days in May and were uh, operating not just within the restricted relay area, but also within the prohibited area. Those shellfish were relayed then to a bed in Stanford, which is referenced in a letter from Dave Carey, which I have uh, as well. So that bed uh, is closed now for, I believe it's six months, um, to allow those shellfish to fully decorate. So with uh, all of this, um, I'm not going to express um, a view. Um, let's just keep this factual. This is uh, this is what happened. Um, we will get some clams from uh, the freights to put on our recreational beds. Um, we're scheduled to do this on September 20th, and uh, may do it on the 23rd or another date uh, later in the month. Uh, we're owed 50 bushels of clams. In, under the terms of the lease that we have for the dairy and co-management bed, as well as 10% of what they took out of Scott's Cove, which they're currently classifying as 49 crates. I don't know how many bushels are in a crate. They have these large boxes. Uh, no, so I, yeah. I don't know if that's three bushels or uh, so. Eyeballing it, it would, yeah, probably. So we're owed something like another 15 bushels of clams, I guess, uh, in addition to the 50 that we're owed uh, under our contract. Where are those coming from, the clams that they're supposed to be? I don't know, but they'll have to come from some other bed other than what is closed. Yeah. But because if they came from the bed that they put them on in Stamford, then we would have to in turn close our recreational beds for six months, which we don't want to do. Well, I was going to say there's a... Um, um, call it a meat um, sampling test. Yes. From the 
clams that are coming from Stanford, which are the relayed ones. Is that one of those? So they move them from here up to Stanford. Stanford. And from and there, if they only took them from the restricted area, the green area, okay. it would only be a two week turnaround. Right. They would clean up that quickly. They clean up probably in 48 hours. And then we would test them, and then they would be able to harvest them. And then they would be putting those clams back on the recreational bed at whatever percentage they're required to, because they were working outside of the restricted area into the prohibited area. Six that requires a six month depuration period and we had to make, I don't know if they moved clams anywhere else other than Stanford, um, but that's all closed now for six months and so those clams that would have been available to relay pretty quickly are now not available, probably until next, it depends when the water temperatures drop because the temperatures need to be above 50 degrees, so May, June, July, August, October, November, it's, <laughs> we've been pushing it for six months, so. And what, what's the process for them to get those clams released? They have to knock on your door and say, hey, we want to now sell they these, call and you us, have to sample them? They call us, we go and pick up, we meet them on the grounds, mm -hmm. we pick up the shellfish, and then we sample them. If the samples are good, which they're clams, they clean up very quickly <laughs> compared to oysters. The samples will probably be fine, um, and then we'll go ahead and release them. But we don't have that process for that which is planted on our public beds. Right, we just say, give us some clams. Give us some clams, and they would have to come from uh, beds. And another, I mean, if they have other beds that are not closed down, if your duty is in September, they've <clears> got to come from some other of their shellfish beds. But do we have a way of, I mean, I'm sorry I'm asking a question which doesn't exhibit a lot of trust, but. <laughs> <laughs> and so, do we have a way of knowing what quality or the clams that are being put in our public beds have been properly depurated, I think that's the term. So, because we have the VMS system in place, um, we can we can see very clearly where they've been harvesting and beds where they'd be taking clams off, we would have to make sure that none of it was from, it's, it's, it's hard. <laughs> so, specifically, when, when David shows up on the boat September 20, how does he know that can, which is What we can arrange boat? is to do the bacteria testing of the shellfish before you put them on the bed, if you would like, okay. just as an extra measure of safety. Um, they're probably coming from their other beds, which are off in approved areas. They're probably fine. They're probably harvesting whatever is there. Um, but the, probably is you know, of some concern. This yeah. is a little like the yeah. guns, the private gun sales. They don't seem to require background checks. And we're all talking about yeah. that. So we, we have more information so, than we've ever had. You know, prior to having the VMS, we wouldn't have any idea. Yeah. Um, so now we'll have to do <clears> some more. It takes some extra analysis of the data to you know to determine that but we do have some concerns you know there's some gaps um in the reports i think um that we're trying to figure out um and we'll just make our we're, we're not going to allow him to move shellfish if there's if there's a concern that he's moved shellfish we would do the same thing and close whatever beds so wherever he's harvesting for market currently is that should be fine you know, unless there was some really shady stuff happening that, you know, we can't pick up with the VMS. Um, but this was happening with the VMS on, with full knowledge that, you know, the VMS was on. So. And, and this is all intra darien and, and the next thing to happen, the transferring to the public beds is all intra darien So I think we have to have a little more circumspection on it than we normally So whatever would. they have open right now is, that's open. <clears throat> For interstate commerce unless we find reason to believe that they've moved contaminated product onto it based on what we know at this time that's not the case because we would have had to, we would have shut them down immediately so um, we can't allow harvest from prohibited areas to get to market so that's the the number one most important thing in the program is to make sure that doesn't happen to keep that stuff out of out of the marketplace and, and would a shell fisherman view planting um, product in a local bed as going as to market, same or is that, market yeah. that they would have yeah. that sort of level in their head. Yeah, it's okay. the same product they were selling every day. Mm -hmm. um, so that's as good as we can do. But we can, if you would feel better, we can test it. There should be no reason why there would be an issue with it. Yeah. But. 
So you. unless we discover something else along the way, because one's alerted to, you know, we can't, we don't look at every boat all, all day long. <laughs> uh, but once we're alerted to something, you know, of concern, right. then we have to delve deeper. And right. So just to recap, like all these dots that I see that he fished in the prohibited area, immediately he went back out and dumped it on 511A or 511B? Yes. And not somewhere else. As far as we can tell. Right, right. <laughs> so, had he wanted to harvest clams from 511A and B? I mean, that's he sort of screwed himself on that one. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, yeah. So Because he's mixed it with other yeah. clams. Right. So everything yeah, it's all... Six months. So. Yeah. so he can't touch those for six months now. Right. So. And now that we know, we have... We do check. Right. We check the tracks and make sure that there's no harvest from those right. beds. Right. So... Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure, that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so he just gets a letter and says we know this. So what we can do is take administrative action. That's our first, that's the first thing that we can do. Um, the next thing would be bringing him in for a pre-license revocation hearing, um, which allows us to present the information that we have, and they can choose to meet a corrective action plan. Usually it involves losing their license for some period of time, um, you know, sometimes as long as 60 days, and that's usually enough to make them um, think twice. We don't, generally not able to, the fines that we're able to charge are generally just such a slap on the wrist compared to not being able to harvest for months. Right. Um, they're losing a lot more income than they would through a fine. And we also don't have the ability to usually um, take cases all the way to arrest, you know, arrest and tickets and all of that. So it's a lot harder to prove. People don't understand. Shellfish program is really, really complex. And I've testified at juries and they don't understand. They really like, you know, it's just too much administration and too many details for people to absorb. Um, so it rarely gets prosecuted. So we do the administrative route because it's, it seems to be the most effective to change behaviors. So How often do you find this type of thing? Well, we've only had the VMS in place for, um, uh, we've only just required it for all vessels that work in closed areas. <clears throat> The beginning of this license period so hmm. now that we have it and we have staff we hired a GIS person who this is what he does is pull the tracks and lines it up with our licenses and it's all he can run queries and find out who's working where they're not supposed to be wow. um, so it's we've had several administrative hearings since just this year and that's more than we've had in 10 years because it's hard to get the data you know it's hard to prove we might suspect things for years and not be able to um, get you know DEP out on the bench when it's happening it's very hard to find. So, so he's not the only one that you've had problems with this year by knowing his knowledge. Yeah. Right. So so just one last question. Uh, uh, what's to prevent him from just switching it off? So there are things that we look for. We can tell if there's tampering in some cases. Um, because it's a satellite unit, they can see disruptions in signals. So there's code that show up um, on the other end. And so there's ways for us to figure that out. Um, and generally, it's our, we have a really good um, research vessel engineer who goes and checks the units. He's worked, um, he's a commercial harvester before he he will work for us and he knows what to look for. He's found Tricks. some he's found <laughs> some you know, some pulled fuses in some cases. <clears throat> and so now people, you know, they're getting to realize that we know, you know, when they're tampering. Yeah. And so we're in the process of having to write uh, right now it's a license, you know, the VMS is uh, part of their license. Um, instead of we don't, have, we don't have regulation right now, so we're in the process of developing regulation okay. for the but, purpose of this. Part of their part of their granting of licenses is participation in the VMS program. Correct. And they can lose their license. Their license is to state, you know, if there's tampering, if there's so if we document things, that's when we can pull them in for an administrative hearing. Um, and so we're doing more of that as we're able to find these issues. How often does the, the GPS system ping? 
two minutes every two when minutes. they're moving. Okay. It's every three hours when they're not moving, and then as soon as they start moving, it flips into two minutes. That's what each of these dot is a two minute. Yes. Yeah. So this is multiple days. This is all the days um, between March 21st and the 20th at two minute increments. So, so what does one purple dot represent? So these would be connected. Um, by lines that show the tracks. So that shows the direction and the speed. And so what we see in the office are the circular, they're not really circular because it's every two minutes, so it kind of looks like this, but you can see they dredge in circles and you can see when someone's dredging um, versus when someone's just doing something else. Um, so you can tell when they're working by the patterns, um, how they're moving, and you can see that when they're steaming somewhere dropping off a load and coming back, that happens very quickly. So it could take them, you know, five, 10 minutes to, to wash a boatload of, you know, shellfish down when they're moving it from place to place, like in this case. So we can sell, I mean, we've had it, we've had VMS for a couple of years now as a pilot program, and you can, you can see things. So the patterns start to become evident. Potentially, would there be a way when Roger ends up in the red, that it could alert him that he's not supposed to be there? So, that's, um, there are alerts that can be set, but because this is way more complicated than any other situation that the VMS has been applied to, and so this company that we're using is a global company. It's mostly for transportation across oceans, so um, when they have things like this in other for other fisheries or generally when they cross a boundary so if they go into like a huge you know area the size of a state basically it can pick them up and it alerts you know us and it would alert them mm -hmm. um, in this case every the the programming of it is very I don't know that we're going to get there or not it's individual lots associated with individual people and having to set individual alerts for each person so there's a lot of layers right, right. But that was our goal, and there's ways that we can do it to a degree, but what I think we're going to require is that they need to have the ability to check their own tracks, because they can see their own boat, and they need to log in, make sure their VMS is functional before they harvest, or else they need to call us and tell us that it's not working. But a lot of these guys, they're not technique, you know, they're not techies, they don't, you know, 90% of them probably can work a computer, um, but this even is a little bit, a little bit more advanced for people, so. It's a learning curve. We have some training sessions and things that. How help. many roughly shellfishes are there in, in like, when you're on the Connecticut side, but the Connecticut side of Long Island side? We have 45 Virginia. companies and probably 120 vessels. That's it. So. On the commercial. On the commercial yeah. side. Yeah. And, and residential individual shellfish permits, is it in the hundreds or is it in the thousands? Recreational is town by town, and that's yeah. probably in the thousands. Some yeah. towns sell a lot, of, a lot of those permits. And we have also seed oyster. They're not harvesters. They yeah. can um, harvest seed and sell it to a, a company. And there's probably 50 of those. So Interesting, just to know volume of what's, what's transpired. Yeah, we have um, a fewer number of companies, and, but they produce a larger volume yeah. than some other states that are more harvesters and smaller smaller people, more yeah. artisans, if yeah. you will. Interesting. Well very good. Well thank you. 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 You guys have late meetings here in the area. We must I don't know. We're going to eleven or twelve. We haven't seen anything. Well thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Where are you commuting from? We'll be in touch. I don't have to go back to New Haven. Oh. My daughter's going to be calling me. She's worse than my mother. She's, when are you coming home? When are you coming home? <laughs> well, thank you for your time. No problem. Thank you, guys. Yeah, and I'll send the presentation out, and you can circulate it. I just have to, there's a few, few slides I threw in there that I have to just give some credit to. I would say All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you again. Is this, yeah. Is this open, or? Uh, I think with the sound that they're close again. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, that, I didn't realize the tracking system was brand new. So I imagine there's a bit of a shot across the bow that maybe a lot of the local harvesters are getting at this type of stuff. But we only have one. Huh? Yeah, I don't really know if I feel there was much issue about finding the landmarks here because they're very. <laughs>
you put the sign up, right? It's red on one side. And it's <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm conscious it's late. It's, it's um, 10 of, and I'm trying to think what is the um, best thing to do. We probably only want to talk for another 15 minutes or so. First, I want to thank Frank for the cookout. Um, right, that was marvelous. I want to thank appetizers, salads, and desserts. <laughs> so that all Sorry, worked. I missed it. It all worked out very well. Okay. Okay. My, uh, my sub was uh, enjoy yourself. Amy, hello. Oh. Yeah, it's it's great place for you. Great place. Next year, same Excuse thing. Yes, yeah, next year we'll do it again. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, David, you're all set on your agenda. That was it. Would yeah, you? that's it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, I've got stuff, but. I actually don't think it's that valuable for me to, unless anybody's looking at something I had there that really um, uh, they're really curious about. I, I, maybe I just will say that, um, so, you know, Tom Lochtefeld and Frank and I uh, did a lot of work on the Connecticut Blue Plan, getting um, some data to ship back to them to get Darien's coastal um, landmarks and, and uh, and peculiarities more pro more properly listed, and we had a very good, I think, uh, interaction with um, the folks at the Nature Conservancy and CTD on our corrections. So uh, basically, everything we suggested was taken by them and absorbed into the new map, with the exception of things like um, uh, waterfowl and uh, different species in the area, where you have to ha go through a process of repeated sightings and logging them in. So like if the Audubon people want to go crazy about sighting birds in our um, coves and stuff, there's a, there's a channel we can um, point them to to try to get that info off the CTD and it can go in subsequent versions of the Connecticut Blue Plan. So I think we did everything we could, uh, including enlarging some of the sailing areas uh, for the local clubs, and, um, Northern Yacht Club. Um, and the final plan was um, it's, it's, I don't think it's yet submitted, but it was wrapped up today. That is, if you had any additional thoughts about what they had crafted, it had to be done by today. So they've submitted and, and we've gotten the full bulk of what we wanted to put in there. So I think that's the only important thing I really had to say. Um, and so I, you know, maybe we wanted to spend the next 15 minutes discussing this idea of task forces. Um, and we probably won't complete it, so maybe we just go for about 15 minutes and get our arms around it a bit and think about it. Before you go there, you need to... Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm no, I, I don't have a harbor so to report. No, I'm, go ahead if you'd like, though. Please. No, thank you. There's nothing to report, realistically, at this point in time. Um, on the ex officio members, uh, Officer Mulcahy uh, has been promoted, right. and so we need to ask the new... Chief of Police, who would be from the Marine Division, he, he is <coughs> he is or has stepped off of the Marine Police uh, boat. Um, so we need to get somebody else on that list. We'll do. We'll have to find out. Yeah, I asked him at the party if that was um, yeah, bad to get off the boat because there's some like such pleasant duty to me if you ask me. He said the one, he said, yeah, he did miss the boat, but he said the one good thing is your uh, shifts get better because when you're on the boat, you're pulled off of some normal shifts and put on some miserable shifts, I guess, the night shifts, and now his shifts will get more regular or something like that. So, um, so do you, Rob, do you want to follow up with the um, police department to see who is going to be the next? Yep, I'll do that. And because we've actually got, uh, last year we had Officer McKay in here give us sort of an end of year report on police activities in the harbor, and I thought that was, was interesting. And I was about to give people a call. We have two more meetings left, and I think we should replicate that. So, you know, maybe he's coming in, or maybe he's coming in with his replacement also, and we can have a little chat. Great. So, uh, well, so do we want to take remaining minutes then to talk about task force ideas? Yeah. Can I just um, ask a quick question? What does sure. UWS stand for? Yeah. Unified Water Study. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, and I put that in there, or we're passing this out, because Carolyn Bain did a wonderful job of taking a lot of disparate facts I had about the, our um, participation in the water study and putting it in the town's application for a sustainability award. You can get bronze or silver, and they've included the water study um, in the town's profile, and she has told me that that's already been approved in our um, application. Um, and so it was a nice, uh, I forget how many points it enabled them. They're either trying to get 200 points or 400, I think, for bronze or silver. Anyways, I think we were like 15 or 20, something like that. 
Anyway, but um, uh, Carolyn did a lot of work, and uh, I think that's neat though, that we can contribute to that. And I think it'd be nice to see how we might contribute to the Sustainability Commission's uh, efforts going forward. So, um, so if you've all got the task force ideas, I don't know if everyone was here when FLIP initiated the concept of task forces. Um, we had maybe five or six in front of us, and we ultimately had three or four that were sort of going. And the two that sort of continue going in form is the dredging task force, um, in that we do a harbor survey that Tom is the implementer of, uh, but that dredging task force initiated, and if something else were to come up on dredging, it would you know, fall under that. Um, I know I was on that. I'm not sure who else, perhaps, Frank. Um, and then the Water Quality Task Force, we've done the Unified Water Study Program under that, um, if you will, uh, authority, if you want to call it that. Just a little, a little bit about the, the dredging, um, yeah. because I don't have anything else better to do with my time. I'm also on the Fair Three Point Beach Committee group, and <clears throat> one of the key uh, modifications or renovations is the uh, boat ramp, fixing it <coughs> right this time, and then obviously dredging at the end. And it's been mentioned to me that as we're, dry, as we're dredging, we would look, re look at the east-west channel at the end of the boat club uh, docks, which according to the survey, um, passed, but there are some issues in some spots, so... Um, the chill points. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, work in process, if you will. Um, but I did mention it to the architect team uh, that we might be interested in, in uh, tying on to um, their dredging efforts uh, whenever they start to do that? I, I think, you know, I, I think what we should do is choose a couple of these to work forward on and have people volunteer for figuring out scope and timetable for tasks. And this, I, this I put one this at the top this, of the list. This one is fairly simple. I don't think it requires a lot of people people effort. Um, we, we have the data from the um, surveys. Sur survey. Um, it's really a paperwork issue, paperwork slash nightmare issue. Yeah. Um, so it just, and, and then the financial side of it uh, as well. Um, necessary, not necessarily borne by the town. Yeah. Um, because the, you know, the, there are pockets, as we said, but the actual report shows that it's fairly, you know, from the end of, you know, whatever it was, 15 feet off the end of the boat ramp to the. Uh, B dock, is it? Uh, to, no to the um, marine, uh, the Coast Guard buoys, the channel is fairly consistent over the last six years. So, right, yeah. So we, I know we have pockets and we need to identify those, but um, we just need to, you know, figure out when they're going to start that project. Uh, well, I, I think that's the most important thing in front of us. I mean, we, we start where we are as a Harbor Commission. I mean, you might say safety in a navigable waterway. And to the extent we've got a choke point at the end of the dock, is it B dock? Yes. And, and sometimes the choke point, as in the past anyway, has come up halfway between the boat club and the yacht club. There's a sandbar in there um, that I've hit many years ago and was pretty ridiculous 20 years ago. Um, but, uh, but, but so to me, we shouldn't miss on these things. Like, like we don't miss on uh, you know mooring standards. That that's this is like our base uh, bread and butter. Yep. And so uh, I mean, I guess. A big check, you know, you're on the Parks and Rec thing and carrying that, and I just want to maybe make sure that um, you know, we're all doing what we can to support that, and and you're reporting back to us on it. So I'm not yeah, quite I, sure of all that procedure, but at, at this particular point, I don't, I don't have anything to report back. I, as I said, I did mention it to the architect; he understands what we're trying to do, and when they get ready to do their deep dive work, you know, is when we need to get involved. But I would guess, you know, that's going to be probably in the spring. Do we have a, a feeling, or could we get a feeling on the cost and make sure that it's not going to be a surprise to the, the rest of the uh, refurbishment when, effort so that people will When be they start that whole process formally, um, we'll have an idea of what they're going to be charged and then whoever's going to be doing it, we'll, you know, we'll ask them for a quote. Because the guys at um, Cook, I'm forgetting our survey, but they may be able to give us some back of the envelope numbers that we start to feed in and get response. Because I, I, I could certainly ask them, but again, yeah, the project, the, 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 the replenishment of the dock, all that's going to be done. So 
that we're going to be you might as well just use their people to go do it give us the, the beach project is pretty far away from starting as well i think right what i've heard or segments, probably of it. Know. So segments of it will probably The focus has been on other topics than the boat ramp so far. Correct. <laughs> yeah. But it, it is understood that that is, that is a piece of the project. Um, probably the one piece of the project which I have yet to hear a contrary opinion to, but I'm just wondering it's what not over yet, so you never know. Should we find someone to show up? You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Well, um, I'm just wondering what potentially the the uh, B doc, I may mean, call it B doc dredging. Is that where the main problem yes, is? Yes. Yeah. What what that might that might add? You know, is it going to add to sort of nightmares of the, you know the dumping of sand? Is that going to add 150,000? No idea at this particular point. The biggest dump. issue we're facing yeah. any uh, dredging. Yeah, just is to give you some dump it. guidance. Yeah, just to give you some guidance, and I think it was was it 2003 or maybe even earlier, like 1999. The whole dredging project was about 124,000, and we dredged the entire footprint of the boat club, um, wow. okay. including the channel and everything else. That, that, was, was, yeah. that was quite a few years your ago. Soils, right? Your, your, your uh, soils, your silt is clean over there, right? Yeah. The silt was analyzed as clean after Sandy. We had tests done, and yeah. the silt was clean, and it could be used as capping silt. Yeah. I think but, probably... I, you know, I'm, I'm assuming no further pollution has come down the river since, but I don't know. Who knows, yeah. Yeah, I think we right. had some maintenance dredging two <coughs> or three years ago. Yes, but right. that was the not a problem right around yeah. the and uh, I think it was because they were spraying off boats right in front of there. I think it was long before that, but yeah. Um, I think that was in the 160, 150 to yeah, they, 150 to 200 area. The dredging, the dumping areas are getting very scarce. Correct. Yeah. Matter of fact, well. They couldn't do it here, but you know the, the the town dredged the river right out here, and if you people would notice the parking lot, though all the silt was on the parking lot. They had to cart it away, but that they you know they couldn't bring a barge up the river. So. Yeah, but um, that's what we hear is, is the dredging, the dumping of it, clean or not, is uh, yeah. the good news is it's literally right out in front of us. Well, that one's still open, right? Right. Yeah, but but aren't there's communicators. Sort of rumors that that might close. That's yeah. the issue. Yeah. That's what yeah. But there's nothing you can do except for ask the question when you're prepared to start doing it. But right. you can't even talk about it. Yet. Well, it's too far down the road. Yeah. So, um, so the, the dredging task force has existed before, and so maybe spurts of activity. And like the most recent was a little time ago, initiating the triennial survey. Um, and so that probably went back. Seven nine years ago or something like that. Um, so I, in, in some ways, so th this is, I think, the task force exists. Do, do you guys want to just be on that, if you will, and make sure oh, you got I'm your, on your, your de you're facto. on it, de facto, yeah. So. But would be reporting back on us and, and thinking of what moves next should be done in terms of talking. As to soon as we get good ideas, yes. I don't think we need to form a task force that did not say anything. So it's nice to call it one anyway. But, uh, you know, I sit on this committee, and that's one of the reasons why I sit on the committee. So yeah, perfect. When we have more information on it, well, then we'll get more accurate, because then we will need some help to figure out what, where exactly you want to do it. You know, in my opinion, it's the east-west channel. Um, but, you know, others need to decide on that. But right. at this particular point, I'm just letting you know that I have talked to the architectural team. But there's, there's other, I mean, I'm trying to remember the, the survey, which I think really was pretty perfect, except for that B-Dock area. Um, I'm just wondering if there's, if you've got the barge there and you're pulling the sand from B-Dock and at the base of the ramp, is there somewhere else you might want to proactively just do a grab? And would that be more questions? Do you, do you all have views on that or want to think about that as part of this process? Uh, quite frankly, I think, aside from those two sort of sensitive areas at the end of B doc. I mean, I, I I haven't heard or seen anything in the profile that was latest presented to us that, that would present a problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the thing you need to keep in mind is the expense of that. Yeah. Right. No. No. I understand. And the report that we have shows that it's fairly clean, except for this small area. So, right. if you're going to try to go outside of that scope, uh, you know, and we're not talking hundreds of dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. So, just a quick question, Tom. That that. Uh, 
uh, hydrographic surveys every two years? Or? I've been doing it every three years. Okay. At, so, at the suggestion of the firm doing it. Right. And the last one was done? October of last year. Okay, October of 18. Okay, October 18. okay, so it could be two years before that. <laughs> well, it could be two years before we finish yeah. building it. Yeah, so. But again, if the boat ramp is, you know, there's separate pods to this right. renovation of the beach area. So. Okay. And we also, we have you know, different windows too. We can't do it when both are in the harbor. Just out of curiosity, related topic, someone comes up to uh, buy gas. What depth can they expect to be right off the gas top? Doesn't have anything at to do with this Dead low, probably six or seven feet at least, if not more. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's quite. It's pretty deep. It's quite. Uh, there's quite a bit of draft in there. I mean, they have that huge sailboat that comes in on the other side. What's the name of that? Blue Flame. Yeah, Blue, Blue Flame. Flame. You know that boat, Frank? Uh, I'll just get a little cat boat, but I was still. It's, <laughs> it's got to be like like six ground. feet. He's got to be yeah, you know, six feet plus. Because he he got. Six I've seen him so. caught on the sandbar half between halfway between. Yacht Club and Daring Boat Club. Oh, he, really? He's been stuck there. And, and I, yeah, and I've been stuck there, but um, okay. uh, I saw him get stuck more to, not dead low actually, pretty near low. Um, yeah. yeah. I think he's six plus. They're at least six plus. They're restricted on when they can go in and out for sure, but yeah. he has a little pocket there that he, his boat can sit the dock, but, right. but can't get in and out. Um, oh, can't is. get in and out. It's pretty tight in there when it's dead low, the little narrow channel. It may yeah. be deep enough yeah. mostly, but it's tight. Yeah. I mean, I get worried cutting the corner in there. And I'm five. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's shift away from that. I mean, I think so the dredging task force isn't the most active one, but it's very important. And I'm hearing two voices who are keeping an eye on things and thinking about it. So um, if you guys sort of accept that. Tom, look at it. We'll process all. Oh, sure. But Tom, Tom, sure. Tom Tom about it. There we go. Um, so, um, do people have other thoughts on these topics? So, the, you know, we've discussed some of these as we've gone along. The water quality keeps bubbling along, and that we're, you know, unified water study is a continual operating thing we do. Um, uh, Rob and I have talked a lot, and, and I've spent a lot of time figuring out how we might do a watershed based plan to work on excess nutrients, non point source. That's sort of big and large and problematic, and I don't quite know how to move it forward. Um, uh, I've talked to you all about maybe we get, might get 319 grants with Fuss and O'Neill, an engineering firm, which might write up an application for us, but there's some issues about sole sourcing. Um, anyway, so that's sort of a big, big complicated thing. I don't, there may be other water quality projects that are easier to tick off than doing that. Um, but do, does any, do any of these other items jump out at people? Um, What's trash, trash pickup? Exactly. Yeah. Is that like volunteer day or something? Or? Yeah, well, so this coming Saturday, actually, there oh. is International Coastal, something like Beach Pickup Day or something. Save the Sound is organizing it. Right. I actually tried to sign up, and they rejected me. I was like, what? <laughs> um, apparently, the, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name, National Charities Foundation or something. It's a... It's a um, uh, Lynn Zuckerman, or she was the head of it, um, Foundation for Daughters and uh, Mothers, um, has already signed up to do Pear Tree Point, and I think they've done it in the past. And I was thinking, geez, we ought to, you know, as a coastal commission, join up forces with the green team or something and have, um, you know, if they're, if they're going to take Pear Tree Point, we, we also take um, uh, Weed Beach and maybe we organize kayaks to go into Cove and Ziegler's. Anyway, it's all happening. Pear Tree Point what? Beach. Yeah, they, they apparently they they go down with with their kids and they um, clean it up. Didn't know about that. Didn't know about it either. <laughs> no, and they, so uh, and Save the Sound doesn't want to parcel it out to anyone else. And I, you know, power to the National Charities Foundation for uh, the That's initiative. The Saturday. To, yeah, the Saturday. I, it, it's not uh, open to the public. It seems to be a closed event for the. <laughs> exclusive. Wow. Exclusive. So I think we might work on this on a broader a scale. Mother, what's the sponsor? Uh, exactly. Um, so International Coastal Cleanup Day at Save the Sound, and the group is the National Charity League. And I saw the name Lynn uh, Zuckerman as last year's uh, chairman. Um, 
But aren't there other nationally or locally sponsored days for like sound cleanup and stuff like that? There, there might be. Yeah, I, I think it'd be a great thing for us to sponsor or join up and do something. You know, it's sort of like a concentrated hit and get our name out there and get people to recognize what we're doing. And right. I mean, I, I actually about fifteen years ago, probably, probably fifteen years ago, because I still have my small boat. I organized a, a trash pickup day and I got Boat US to sponsor us with a free. Uh, towing membership as like first prize as to wow. the amount of garbage picked yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, great. And but I just haven't been motivated to like ask him since I, I I sort of like the idea of Save the Sound sponsoring it because I figured that maybe they'd come down and bring trash out. bags on the day of or something and just take care of some of the logistics, including a yeah. sign or something. Um, but so the idea was for one of us to look into that. Um, some version of it, work in Boat USA, whatever, um, I think um, I notice our water's a lot more littered than five years ago. I don't know if you guys do, but I, I see it. It's funny, I don't definitely. see that. Yeah. I'm, I'm positive myself. I could be my own. On the water or closer to? On the beach? Actually both. Hmm. Yeah. I see, I, I've seen more on the water in the sound, but not in the air, not in the harbors. Yeah. You can go over to like Shea Island or something and it's, you know, it's like up on this, you know, it's definitely washed up. But I, I think it's a perfect um, target for us to figure out something to do about. And so if somebody here would want to give it some thought, um, the, yeah, so the idea I have here is that, you know, we have some task force that are ongoing. This would be rather specific. Um, but uh, they're ongoing. Uh, whoever volunteers can make their own scheduled activity. Um, and tell us what you're doing and see where we can help. But it's not trying to get people to uh, get overrun with work in a given month. It's having them pick up, pick up something they think they can tackle and do over these next 12 months. Um, we have to get some more topics to tackle. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So um, uh, it, I, I myself am a little overrun with the water quality stuff at the moment. That There's six months, May to October, that I do that, and that's... That's a lot of hands-on stuff, um, and so uh, that's sort of difficult. But uh, I'd like to do something in the off season more. But so I, 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 anyway, I'd love for someone if they have a um, a uh, liking of the trash pickup idea to think what they could do about that. The water harbor safety is that more of a public education thing, or is this? Well, you know, I, I thought that's what we have the cops for. Yeah, it's, no, it's also getting more of a. No, not the, well, I guess we do the cops for that. Yeah, they're pretty good at alerting to life preservers and stuff. Yeah. But, for example, I talked to Pam Geary about, um, this was uh, in April, about um, uh, somehow getting some educational material out to the people who were renting the town kayak racks, and mm -hmm. SUP racks. I mean, there'll be some day we have some young kids go out in April or May. It's a beautiful day, but the water's 45 degrees, and they won't have life preservers on. You know, that, that happens, unfortunately, in Long Island Sound two or three times a year if you keep your eye open for that. And Picked one up last weekend. It, excuse me? Picked one up, overturned kayak, and he was picked up by Stanford. Right. And it happens regularly when in the spring when the water's literally winter temperature, but the air is, you know, almost summer. Um, and young people seem to get all fired up and off they go. Um, and so I suggested to her we put in some cold water warnings and also some PFD warnings um, and also some float plan warnings. Float plan is something hardly anyone thinks about. It's a very simple device. Float. When you're going out, when where are you going to go, how long are you going to be out? Right. I do that with my wife literally every time I go out. Because I've gotten conservative, but um, it makes sense, and very few people do it. Um, so you, you know that's like one harbor safety idea. And Pam was very receptive to that, but I think she would need someone to design like a, a flyer or something um, to put with the materials. Okay, I can hit the scouts up again. That's that's something right up there, early. Like. Yeah, or, or or you know, so I'm not trying to dictate these things. Mm -hmm. and so that's a you know trash litter gets rather specific, but water harbor safety is broad. You could think up three or four projects you want to do in the year and see if some other people can uh, help out on them. So that's, I think that, you know. Who did you have in mind for commission, uh, commission outreach? Were you thinking more like like news outlets or uh, 
or just the general public? You know, um, I, I, I have two thoughts on that. Um, one is I, I think we should be outreaching to the public a lot more. And um, I sent along, I wasn't trying to publicize my dour routing, writing, but um, this is Darian Neighbors. And uh, someone asked me to write up a little blurb in the, um, I got the back page, unfortunately. Write a little blurb on the water quality program that the commission sponsors. And, uh, you know, I think we should have more things like that. Like, we do standards for moorings. Um, you know, someone could write up an interesting article about that and get everyone a little more conscious about their moorings. Jeff, I can't can be the standards guy. for moorings. We, we have, a, as a yeah. commission, have set the standards for the moorings in the town. Um, so, I mean, that's the material you have on your website indicating what people should have. So there's been points in time where we said, hey, how heavy should the weight be? And we experts know what we've asked and made sure that those standards meet the requirements of people who know. Um, so anyway, um, outreach, um, you know, the stuff in the paper, um, that, that's the public outreach side to let people know of the things we want to let them know of and what we do. And I think there's also a government side to that. Um, are we outreaching enough to the people we report into? You know, the Board of Selectmen, um, David Knopf, uh, Health Department, um, Environmental Protection Officer in, in here, Jacobson. Um, they all may have things that, that they suggest that they'd like us to do. Um, so I think that's really almost a full-time function. There could be someone who just says, I periodically want to go around and talk to all the government people who matter here. Um, or I periodically want to see where we could plan an article. Um, or, or, or I want to write a piece for the, um, the, the, the papers, the patch, because here's an important issue. Um, I think that's almost a full-time function. You could come up with something to do every month if you wanted, or something to do every quarter. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. It's yours. It's your. It's got your address on it. You're gonna frame this. I'll talk. I'll keep it here. <laughs> it's a great order. I think it's a little boring and written, but I, I I'm going to spice up my writing more. I've got to figure that out. <laughs> anyway, um, I, look, it's late. It's 9.20. I, I don't think there's more to decide here. But um, I think we'd like to walk away thinking about picking up another two or three areas here and, and how we might individually carry them forward. Um, it could be just something you want to do individually or join up with somebody. And... Uh, you know, I think the, the work you do on those things would be more important than the showing up here. You know, it's more important to get a topic going and get it moving and then report back to us and, and missing a meeting, you know, doesn't matter as much as uh, keeping something going that, that's starting to, you know, functionally help our area. Does that make sense? Yeah. Why don't we um, maybe communicate more by email on some topics that... Maybe people get um, perked about, and if you don't see anything this time, you maybe keep thinking about where you might contribute and uh, just get a little more activity going, I think. One notation before we adjourn. Um, periodically we have at uh, Weed Beach uh, Flare Up, which is a way of educating the public as to how to use emergency flares and dispose of their expired flares. Uh, it's been done over three years a joint project between this commission and the uh, Dairy and Power Squadron. It's worked out very well to have it as a, as a joint project because in order to have it at Wheat Beach, it's so much easier to have Park and Rec grant a permit for using the Wheat Beach for that activity to be a colleague uh, town activity. So what uh, when, when a date is uh, uh, selected, it will be probably be one of the weekends immediately prior to Memorial Day, because the beach is open to the public on Memorial Day. So one of those weekends coming in on that. Um, under the name of the Harbor Commission, uh, we would apply to Park and Rec for a permit to use the beach. And then a squadron would come along to implement that and actually uh, conduct, the, uh, conduct the exercise. Uh, last time we did it, uh, I mean, you haven't done it that way before. Then. It will be coming up this spring. Yeah, but you haven't done the use the Coastal Commission as the yes for for the last 
nine. Oh yeah, yeah okay. Coastal Coast Unbeknownst to me, has 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 technically been the sponsor okay. of the event because okay. it's a, then it becomes a, a town to town or a, yeah, yeah, right. permit, yeah. which is easy to get. Yeah, yeah. And then the squadron comes in and, and actually conducts it. Then. You see, we get no bang for the buck for that. You know, you know, here they are having all this fun, and, and we're sitting there, I guess, having enabled you. We, come, we should somehow come down and shoot some flares. We should see some flares. No, but you know, you know, maybe that's a good thing for someone to write something in the paper about and make sure our names there. And, and why does that matter? Because it can help enable us to do other things. That people. Uh, you'll notice people. in all the public of the Harbor Commission, yeah. gets a gets a message. Crosses. And helps out. And you need new fl uh, new flares, right? Old flares for this. Okay, I think I've got some expiring next spring, Frank. Well, what happens is uh, uh, people will donate uh, the Orion flares that we all have. Right. But then we also go and get some of these Solos flares, mm -hmm. which are like Fun's six better. times better yeah. right. and higher and more fun to fire. Um, while the Coast Guard wants to have flares on your boat that expire every three years, uh, the Solos flares are 15, it can be fired up to 15 years, mm -hmm. you know, and they're expensive. But um, uh, some wise boaters will get a couple of Solos flares and just keep them, and then and then get some dinghy flares that Orion just to keep the Coast Guard happy. I don't think the, ding I don't think the uh, Orion flares really expire. Oh, they, they have a little stamp on them. I know, but and, that's and, and, No, but, but we're forced so to get to sell more flares. We're forced yeah. to buy. Yeah. You said that I didn't. Happy, but more, you get the nice ones So what happens is your company, a couple of companies up in Newport that repack uh, life rafts uh, for commercial vessels and ocean going racers and all that, and they have their own standards. So what they do is you have your life raft repacked, the fellows will open it up, take the big solos flares, Put over in the corner and, and sell you the new ones, and you that's part of the package. Oh, sorry, okay. folks. And uh, the, the ones that are over on the corner are really very good, and so we go up and, and, and get a good supply, an SUV full of them, and bring them down. And so when people come to fire the flares, we have the Solos flares for them to get from under with, uh, which is uh, the parachute. <laughs> so yeah, I've never fired there. my Solos, I, yeah. I would enjoy that. It all works out. Yeah. How come you only do it every three years? Just Resources and availability. It takes a lot of effort to put it on, and I, uh, we we believe that um, <laughs> they, they this the shelf life of doing it every yeah. year, people can board with it. So we and they have and it kind of coincides with the three-year expiration of the players that you have to get rid of. And I wouldn't mind practicing every year because. Yeah. It's like CPR. If you were trained three years ago, you probably don't want to remember it anyway. Yeah. So so uh, in the three-year schedule, uh, spring of. 2020 will be our year to do it again. Last, last question? Yeah. Uh, with the funding from the Border Selectmen that was used to do the various border quality project, the, the good wise test. When we got that money last time, it was sort of an emergency appropriation and arranged for in August. Right. Yeah. Well, what's new? Do we, can we, okay, not what's new? But in the town's budget cycle, they're just getting started now, and the budgets kind of freeze up around December, and then they go through the RTM process. Can we put in for an appropriate amount to be used on the continuation of the work quality testing? That's sort of a complicated subject. It sure is. Yeah. <laughs> And and, what and, who, these, and who do you apply to? Well, we would yeah. we apply to our boss, which is the board of select. Yeah. We'll then put it in the budget from the, from the health department or public works, who, who don't. Well, one of the budget invaded. One of the reason, reasons I've been looking into the watershed based plan is because it would provide a continual source of funding for water quality products, projects, 319 grants. Um, and I guess one of the things that Flip and I have talked about is the Goodwives River, which was so successfully tested and we got funds for that. Um, there were relatively um, few results. There were a couple of good strong hits, but we've corrected those now. And the question is, um, you know, are you, what will we get on the next river? And, and as a one-time um, 
receipt of funds and testing the appropriate thing to do, or is more, or, or will you only get a couple hits? And what you really need is a more constant source of funding to monitor and programs to fix things over time. And that latter is um, course of activity is really where the 319 grants are more beneficial than a one-time dose from the town. So haven't solved all that. But should you be, be getting an annual dose from the town? That's a sort of nice idea. But we don't have a pro we don't have a program yet in place to sort of figure that out. So there's the water quality. That's what you should have a task force working on. Yeah, yeah. We sort of need that. Well, it would be appropriate to put a, a placeholder request in. So that we don't come along chasing the caboose on the train once the budget train has left the town, at least to put in a um, a letter of well, understanding or a memo of understanding to town administrator that hello, yeah. we're here. We would uh, like to uh, uh, reserve twenty thousand uh, dollars. I'll go for thirty. But um, I, that, I, that, that project yet to be determined. I, I, that fires my imagination. I, I don't yet know. Um, I'm happy to talk more to you about it. I think just to start in on it, it's a little late. But um, I like the idea, and I wonder, you know, what's our vision on the water quality side, where we may say, and, and we probably would point to using the funds that way. Well, we had so good, pro even though we didn't find any significant uh, well, we found errors. Once, once again. We get good credit. We're asking, yeah, and the results came back fairly good. Well, that doesn't mean you can't do right, it. It's like you take, an, you have to take a scientific experiment. There's not one set of results. It's the fact that you have results that you get yeah. to, you know. um, and we can take good news. Well, the Naroton River is is a river which could use a lot of improvement. And Harbor Watch is regularly funded to sample it and to undertake some projects. And I've had chats with Sarah Crosby about what Darien could do to more permanently attack problems up that river. And that would be the idea to I think, think about. It. Maybe we should just approach well, uh, that very topic. Um, oh, the Mr. Chair, can we? Yeah. So can what, we take this as a sidebar? Yeah, very, yeah. very, very, very <laughs> glad so, what, so Frank, you and I should talk some more. And I would urge anybody who's interested in water quality to join in on this. I, I think you know this is. Um, a huge area for us. We can do a lot here. The question is, does it overwhelm the committee? Um, we have to figure out parcels that make sense for us. So, anyway. Meeting adjourned? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming. Thank